we finally got him back to join our podcast. The great Rabbi Botnik is here, and he prepared something so amazing, so incredible, so mind-bending. If you thought the previous episodes of Rabbi Botnik were complicated and uh, maybe uh, nuanced and multi-pronged, uh, this sets a new bar, a new standard. And I will say, we had a little bit of a, of a technical snafu, and usually we each record independently and then we merge them together, but now we're recording it on the Zoom call because there was some sort of glitch, some sort of problem with his recording apparatus. So the audio might not be crystal clear like it usually is, but I'll tell you, it's not just the audio that you'll have to strain to understand because... The amount of moving parts uh, Rabbi Botnik, as he likes to do, sends me like at the last moment, his notes. It's nine pages of notes and it's an absolute roller coaster, rollicking ride. It's it's magnificent, but this is one of those episodes you have to listen to you know, maybe two, three, four, eight times uh, before you understand what he's going at. Uh, it's masterful. It's uh, magisterial. And it sets a new bar. Rabbi Botnik, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast and for sharing your incredible mind-bending genius and wisdom with the audience. Well, thank you so much, Rabbi Wolby, for having me again. And my mind is bent plenty. Um, I think we're going to have to do a few takes of this podcast till I get it straight. Um, I want to just begin, obviously, by pointing out that this whole shear should be as chus for all that's going on. Um, we may we see uh, salvation speedily and in our days. Yes. Okay, Absolutely. so shall we? Yes, I, I, I was thinking what we should do maybe just to make it a little bit more accessible is to kind of just go through the various different events, personalities that you're referencing in this uh, in this presentation, just so people are maybe grounded to know, you know, what we're talking about, and and then we'll try to put it all. You'll try to put it all together. I'm not responsible for this. <laughs> You're responsible for it. Put it all together and and kind of present it in the in a beautiful way. What do you say about that? Sure. Do you want me to do that, or do you want? Oh, uh, we that? could do it together. So I I I went through I went through almost all of your notes, not all of it, but I kind of I think I I see the basic outline, the skeletal outline. But we're going to be talking about Enosh. Enosh is the grandson of Adam. Is that right? He's the grandson of Adam. And he's, in scripture, plays a very marginal role. We don't really hear much about him. We have the 10 generations from Adam to Noah. And it kind of lists Enosh very briefly. But Rashi tells us, and certainly the the Midrash and the Talmud talk about how Enosh played a pivotal role in the devolution, the degradation of humanity. He was the one, or in his time, in his generation, in his era, that's when idolatry was introduced. There's the iconic uh, chapter in Rambo, the beginning of the laws of idolatry, it talks about how in the times of Enosh, and Enosh himself was participatory in this, there was this mistake where the nations or the, the people of the world did idolatry, and that kind of led to the the spiritual degradation of humanity. And you're specifically highlighting, if I'm, I don't want to I don't put words in your mouth, but the the presentation is going to highlight the fact that in the times of Enosh, and Rashi reads this down in this commentary to the Torah, there was a preliminary flood. Of course, we have the flood in the times of Noah, the the the, the flood and the ark and all that. But there was a preliminary flood. It didn't cover the whole world like it did in the times of Noah. It covered a third, I believe Rashi says. But there was a preliminary flood in the times of Enosh as uh, uh, almost a retribution for the crimes of the people of that generation. Yes? Yes, correct. Uh, just to point out the obvious that this is all in the context of trying to understand the deeper meaning of the month of Cheshvan, right? So I know that we are um, almost at the halfway point of Cheshvan, but it's better late than ever. So we're, we are going to try to use this to explain um, the, the inner meaning of Cheshvan. And we're going to move on um, from... The uh, from Enosh, I think the next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to focus a lot on Moshe Rabbeinu. Well, it's also right? the flood, the actual flood of Noah. Yeah, we are. We're going to touch on the actual flood of Noah, and then we're going to touch on the re- revolt um, of Yeravam many, many, many years later. But so Moshe specifically, we're going to highlight the fact, or you're going to highlight the fact. That- uh, yeah, with Moshe Rabbeinu, we're going to highlight the fact two two points of Moshe Rabbeinu's life: his being cast into the river 
as a very as a, as an infant, right? To be hidden away from uh, the Egyptians. Chapter two of Exodus, uh, they're throwing all the Jewish babies into the water, and his mother makes an improvised little boat, a mini ark, if you will, and places Moshe in it, and he's retrieved by the princess, and he grows up as a surrogate son of of the princess. Okay, that's one. What else? And we're going to move on to actually another two uh, another two uh, very critical points in his life. The next one being um, when he, by the splitting of the sea, when he sang Az Yashar, he led the Jewish people in song. Yeah, so this um, is after the Exodus, a week after the Exodus, the nation is uh, pursued by the Egyptians and they're trapped and uh, they jump into the water and the water splits and miraculously the nation is able to walk amidst walls of water and then the Egyptians follow and they get swamped and in the aftermath of that we have the song of uh, Az Yashir where the nation breaks out an exultant, exuberant song. Correct. And then we're going to move on from there. We're going to talk also about a more uh, a negative period in his life where uh, he had the episode with the main Mariva, right? So that's with the, with the well that he was supposed to speak to and he hit instead and he was punished severely. Uh, the original plan was he was supposed to enter Eretz Yisrael. He was supposed to build a base of Mikdash. All that fell apart, and really the rest is history. Um, so we're going to touch upon that as well. So we have the water of Enosh, the water of the flood, yeah. Moshe being thrown into the water or being placed in the water as an infant, uh, the splitting of the water. Uh, we have uh, the when there is no water, and Moshe is told to speak to the rock, instead he strikes it, and that does emit water, but that is the sin that, you know, God says to Moshe and Aaron, this is why you're going to be barred from entering the land. And no matter how much Moshe tries to reverse that and all his prayers, it doesn't work. And several times in the Torah we're told about this sin, which you called it the May Mariva, the, uh, the quarrelsome waters, maybe you would translate it as. But these are the, the waters that caused all of our problems because now we don't have Moshe and uh, all of the ensuing history changed because we don't have Moshe uh, leading us into the land. Correct. So uh, we're going to touch a lot upon um, the the uh, Yerubim ben Nevat and his his re- revolution against the um, the kingdom of of David Hamelach. But David Hamelach had already passed away. So this was he came out against Shlomo Shlomo Hamelach and primarily against Shlomo's son. Rechavam, after Shlomo passes away. Okay, so then once the nation's ready in the land of Israel and they already have a hundred, couple hundred years of the judges and Samuel, he anoints Saul as the first king and then Saul is deposed and then David is anointed as king and then David dies and then Solomon is anointed as king and then Solomon dies and his son Rechavam takes over and that's when you have the big, the big uh, secession, the big schism where Jeroboam, Yeravam, he is the one who launches this rebellion against the Davidic monarchy and he begins the the kingdom of israel versus the kingdom of judah and that is you know one of the sad low points of our history where the nation splintered and fractured into two and the leader of that secession the rebel is jeroba and he's going to play a big role here as well uh just to point out why he's going to come in is because what the what he does is the, the great sin of Yeruvim is that he sets up two uh, golden calves. We have a long history with golden calves. And he, I, I think he encourages the people to worship the golden calves. And that happens in the month of Cheshvan. Right? That, oh, that also relates to the month of Cheshvan. Right. So last year we did the, the deeper secrets of the month of Cheshvan. Now we're going even deeper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, deepest... spoke... <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully next year we'll go even deeper. But we, we spoke about Yeravim a lot last year as well. Yeravim is, I mean, Yeravim is very much, he's clearly connected to Cheshvan. He he even moved um, the, he even moved the um, holiday of Sukkot from Tishrei to Cheshvan. Yes, okay. So this is basically the subjects that are going to be intersecting in this, in this podcast. Let's start. All right, so let's begin. Um. Let, let's first talk about Noah, right? So the the Mabel, we are taught, began in the month of of Cheshvan, right? 
It says, um, this is in Voracious chapter 7, verse 11. Very, I made the joke of a bunch of times, but it's, uh, I'll say it again. It's a very easy citation to remember. 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven, right. They all went for Slurpees as the rain started pouring down. Um, okay, and then it says, okay, uh, well, relevance is, Lachodesh Hashem, in the second month, Sheva Asar Yom Lachodesh, on the 17th day. So, I mean, actually, it's interesting because it's not clear that it's Cheshman because there's two ways of counting the year, right? Either... The year begins in Tishrei, or the the year begins in Nisan, right? Um, but and Rashi brings could up, mean either the month of of ER or the month of Cheshvan, right? Because it's the second month. But okay, we're going to work that it was Cheshvan, as Rashi brings down that is the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, and that's really how we Paschanite, right? We rule that Rosh Hashanah is on the first day of Tishrei, or you don't observe Rosh Hashanah on the first day of Nisan. So we're going to work with um, we're going to work with the opinion that the year begins in Tishrei. And the second month that the verse is referring to is the month of Cheshvan. Okay, so the Mabo begins in Cheshvan. That much uh, is un, uh, that much is irrefutable. The rest of the share is likely refutable, but that much is that much uh, we could be certain of. Now, the the verse says later that Hashem tells uh, Noah that he's going to bring the flood and he's going to destroy. All of men. And Rashi points out that Hashem says, Hinini Muchan, I am prepared, Lahaskim im Osam, to agree with those, Shazir Zuni. Um, how do you translate Shazir Zuni? Encourage me. Encourage Urge me. me. Right? The Amru Lafanai, they said before me, uh, Kvar, they already said before me earlier, Ma Enosh Kisiz Karenu. What is man that he should be remembered? So th- this is referring to an old debate that goes back to pre-creation, um, or at least pre-creation of men, that there was a contingency of angels that tried to convince God not to create man, and they used this verse, Ma Enosh ki says, Karenu, what is man that he should be uh, remembered? So Hashem is saying, I am going to agree with them. I mean, originally I disagreed with them, and I went ahead and I created man. I am now going to uh, adopt their position, and I'm going to destroy all of men. That, that's what Rashi comments on the verse. So there was this, some sort of debate or discussion or consultation. God said, let us make man, like Rashi cites in chapter one, that there was a discussion that God conducted with the angels. And we're told that there were some angels that said, yes, it's a great idea. And some said, no, it's a terrible idea. And ultimately, God did create men, as we know. But now God's saying, well, maybe I'll take the other side of that discussion now. The the conditions in the, um, I have to say the word, in the antediluvian era. <laughs> Sorry, I have to say it. Oh, man, it just came up, right? It wasn't planned. <laughs> Can you <laughs> but, educate me on its meaning? Yeah, it means before the flood. Okay. <laughs> like anti means before, like antebellum, etc. cetera. Um, antechamber. So the antediluvian period where the nations or the where the generation of, of Noah became so corrupt that this warranted adopting the position of the angels that said it's a bad idea. Who is man? Who is Enosh? Who is man uh, that you should reckon with him, that you should remember him? It's not it's a terrible idea because man is so full of evil and so um, so predisposed to, to, to lying and to robbery and to theft. And it's just a terrible idea. This, this idea, God says, okay, fine, I'm, I'm adopting that opinion. Right. Okay, so the Ramban, he questions Rashi. Okay, and, and he uses very extreme terms. He says, I, Tama. I, I am baffled by Rashi's comment. He says, how can you say that God is a, adopting the position of those who say, what is man that he should be remembered? Because what that position suggests is that man should not exist at all. And the Ramban says man continues to exist because God's plan here was not to destroy all of man, it was to destroy most of man, but to keep Noah and his three sons and their respective wives. And thus, an entire new humanity will evolve. So God was not, he was he, he just wasn't working with the ideal of Ma'enoshki Siskarenu. He very much planned on reckoning and, and remembering man. He just wanted to wipe out you know, the majority of them. The of the angels was no humans. 
and here it's mostly no humans, but still, you know, one family. So it's an impartial adoption of of the angels' positions, according to you know, it's Ramban's question on, on Rashi. Okay, correct. And so we're going to work with that as a question. We're, we are now going to move on to a, a whole and, bunch and, of other. Know, I want to point out something. I mean, this is obvious, but. Uh, the term that it uses is here for humanity is enos, right? Exactly, uh, exactly. So that's why I wanted to give a little sneak preview, um, right? So we're going to digress to a bunch of other things. We're going to talk a lot about this enos, uh, the, the individual enos, not so much about him, but, but what his, his generation represents. But I'm going to give the listeners um, just a sneak preview that we are going to get back to to enos, and we're going to suggest that the enos Rashi is referring to here is not not human, which at the humanity, which is how we would originally translate it, but Enosh specifically. It's like the, the Hebrew word for man is Adam, is Adam, right? So it's Adam. So it's named after the first man. And uh, there's also another name for humanity, which is Enosh, which is like humanity. But that's also a person, you know, Adam's grandson, who plays a very important role in the in 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 the events that uh, that shaped humanity uh, in his time. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so let's move on to many hundreds of years later. Shlomo Amalek builds the Beis HaMikdash. Okay, Rabbi Wolby, do you know when Shlomo Amalek built the Beis HaMikdash? What month did he build the Beis HaMikdash in? Uh, what, to make it easier, what month did he celebrate its inauguration? In? So I, I, I did see your your notes. So I'm not, uh, this is not a type of aptitude. <laughs> Okay, uh, but, but, I mean, but this is he, well known. He, he either built way. it, and then he established it in the month of Nisan. It, well, no, well, he he. Um, yeah, he that, that that was the Mishnah. The Mishnah wasn't. Uh, yeah, the Mishnah wasn't in Nisan. He's Shlomo Melch celebrated the inauguration of the Beis in the month of Tishrei. Tishrei um, yes. Right, the Gemara tells us it, it's absolutely, it, it's unbelievable that they celebrated um, like seven days prior to Sukkot, which includes Yom Kippur. So they were celebrating on Yom Kippur. Um, maybe that will make for a podcast one day. How in the world could Shlomo Melech basically just do away with Yom Kippur? A- anyways, that's got nothing to do with this. But they didn't observe Yom Kippur. And that's what it sounds like. It sounds like they didn't observe Yom Kippur. Yeah, I, I didn't go through this this time around. But but okay, so let, let, yeah. I did see notes here. I just so we have the Mishkan was it was was built in Kislev and Orgon and Nisan, and then we have the the Temple of Solomon, which was actually built in Cheshvan, but it was delayed. The inauguration was delayed until 11 months later to the month of Tishrei. Right. So that's how it works. So Shlomo Melech actually finished building the month, uh, the, the, the base mention in the month of Cheshvan, and he inaugurated it in the month of Tishrei. Now, the, we know this because that's what the verse tells us. Okay. The verse tells us that he completed um, building the base of Mikdash in the Yerach Bull, the month of Bull. And what in the world is the month of Bull? Um, the we, the Talmud tells us that this refers to the month of Cheshvan. Okay, one second. We'll explain why it's called that. And for whatever reason, Shlomo Melech, he received a, a divine direction to delay the inauguration until the month of Tishrei. But for some reason, he did, for some reason, it was orchestrated that he should complete the building of the base of in Cheshvan. And Cheshvan is referred to as Yerach Bull. Now, the reason why it's referred to as Yerach Bull, the Psikta, that's a Medrash, tells us, is it's referring to the Mabul. Okay? The Mabul, we know, began in Cheshvan. So when you want to describe the month of Cheshvan, you say Yerach Bull, the month of the Mabul. Okay? Yeah, and, and Mabul, again, that's the flood. That's the Hebrew word for the flood. The flood, right. The, the, the flood started in the month of Cheshvan, and the flood in Hebrew is called Mabul, and the month of Cheshvan, thus, the short, short version of it is Bull. That's right. Man plus the word bull. So two questions we're, we're going to focus on is, A, you know, Cheshvan is a pretty nondescript month. Um, why is it that he, why is it that the Beis HaMikdash was completed in Cheshvan? And I think I forgot to mention that the Medrash says that because Cheshvan lost out on the opportunity to have the Beis HaMikdash built, the original Beis HaMikdash built, it will, in Mir Hashem, be the month in which the Third base of Mikdash is built. So that's this current month. That's the current month. So we have, what is it? We have about 18 days um, for that prophecy to be realized, right? But we, we don't, we don't uh, disrupt Torah study to build a temple. Okay. Someone so we have to call, call the 
I'm gonna get some notification mail listen to the podcast uh that they're calling uh <laughs> all the uh welders and engineers and plumbers to Jerusalem to go build a temple. You have to finish the podcast first. That's right. That's right. Okay. All right. So let's do this quickly. Um <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. So, 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 so the first temple was finished in the month of Cheshvan. It wasn't inaugurated till the month of Tishrei, which is almost a year later. But the month of Cheshvan has a claim now to the temple being rebuilt or being built in in that month. And the future temple, the third temple, will be built in the month of Cheshvan. Correct. The way of appeasing, and, so to speak, the month of, of Cheshvan, the month of right. Bull, known as the month of Bull. Known as the month of Bull. So the two things we're going to try to explore is A, what's the significance of Cheshvan that it deserves the base of Mikdash? And B, why in this specific context are we referring to Cheshvan as Yerach Bull? I get it. The Mabul happened in Cheshvan. I'm sure other things happened in Cheshvan. Like in the context of building Mesa Mikdash, they say, oh, the month in which the Mabul occurred. It seems kind of weird. And again, giving the reader some insight, the direction we're going to take this is that there is an association between the Mabul and and the Beis HaMikdash, right? So this is all going to, and Enosh, okay? So this is all going to come together, how there's this Enosh who was wiped out in in the month of Cheshven by the Mabul, and some of it has to do with wait, the building wait. of the Beis HaMikdash. First flood in the time of Enosh also happened in the month of Cheshven? No. I mean, I, I, that's what, okay. Oh, no, it did not, but... but I mean, Enosh has any humanity. Yeah, Enosh is in humanity. And like the words that Rashi quotes. The that, words that Rashi quotes. So okay. again, I'm just trying Enosh to put the things together. I, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm here like representing the audience who's like, yeah. uh, well, I had too many parts, too many things going, it's going too fast. Okay, so you're saying there must be an association. If we're, we're calling the month of Cheshwan bull specifically in the context of the building of the temple, it must be that there's something, and, and, and the term bull as, a, as, as the moniker of the month of Cheshwan is because of the ma bull, the flood. It must be that the flood is associated with the third temple. Please, I will be will be built in the month of Cheshvan. Yes. Okay. Proceed. Okay. Now let's jump to another episode in history, and that, as we mentioned earlier, is going to be Yeravam. So, you know, I, I actually I reviewed the verses a few times. I, I cannot cease to be completely floored by the episode that went down between Yeravam and Shlomo Melech. Uh, I'm not going to read the verses here, but basically, in a nutshell. Um, we know, we're taught in the verses in Malachim, that Shlomo Melech, however you understand this, married the daughter of the Egyptian pharaoh, not the original Egyptian pharaoh, I don't think, this was a long time after, but the Egyptian pharaoh of the time, he married his daughter called Bas Paro. Shlomo Melech married Bas Paro, and there was all kinds of you know messy stuff that went on there. She tried to get him to sin, with a, in, in, I think it was idolatry. Whatever happened, happened. But the point is, he married the daughter of Paro. Now, he did something, also not 100% clear. Um, apparently, he like blocked a certain entranceway into Jerusalem. And it's not clear why. It's be- I think one of the explanations is he wanted everyone to go through a different entranceway. That way, they could be taxed. And that would raise money um, to support this his new wife, the daughter of Paro. Okay, S- and, this, and this leads somehow to the rebellion of Yeravam initially against. Well, it doesn't. Just, it doesn't just lead to it. That's the cause of the rebe- rebellion as well. Yeravam approaches Shlomo and he openly criticizes him for this move. Saying, "What are you doing? Why are you charging this tax? Um, I'm super upset about you. Upset at you for that." Um, and then a series of events happens. Um, you know, we could skip. I mean, later Shlomo Melch dies, and then they approach Rechavam, who's the son of Shlomo, successor to Shlomo, and they say, "You get rid of this tax." And he says, "No," and they break off. They create a whole new kingdom, and then the next thing you know, Yeravam is erecting calves in the month of Cheshvan, and they're bowing to it. It sounds ridiculous, and and here's what you have to bear in mind: Shlomo Melch was the wisest of all men, right? Okay, so he was even wiser than Rabbi Wolby. Are Can you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Not even the brightest son-in-law. <laughs> uh, we can argue about that. But now, Yeravam was also exceptionally brilliant. Uh, the Talmud tells us that he knew everything. It says, uh, the verse says someone, Yeravam was in the field, in the Sada, and, and the, the Talmud interprets that homiletically to mean he, he the, the entire Torah is open to him like an open field. He knew absolutely everything. He knew These more. Are not lightweights. These are not lightweights yeah. or simpletons. 
And they're fighting and over something that's Solomon doing something uh, untoward with the daughter of Pharaoh and blocking the passage and charging taxes, and it seems so petty and small. And the Yeravam is is launching a rebellion, and then he's making uh, he's making apparently idols in the shape of a golden calf. I can't believe you're doing that again. In the month of Cheshvan, it's it seems very mysterious, and it, it it seems hard to reconcile with the kind of caliber of people that we're talking about over here. Exactly. So. Um, we're going to try to work that out. Not that we're going to explain, uh, understand the full depth of what's going on, but at least maybe try to peel away um, the most outer layer. Okay. Um, let's start with the Gemara and Sanhedrin, the Kufal base. Okay, that's 101b. That tells us they have different interpretations for the word Yeravam, which is his name. Right? Oftentimes, the, the Talmud will take a person's name and try to demonstrate how the name reveals something of his essence, something of his destiny. So here, the Gemara offers a few of them uh, for the word Yeravam, one of them being that it comes from the word Meriva, right? And Meriva means... Um, quarrel, we said, right? A quarrel, quarrel. Um, okay, that, that's it. That's all I'm going to mention from that Gemara. But what I will mention is that the word Meriva is familiar to us, right? Because the whole issue um, over there with Moshe Rabbeinu and the well was called the May Meriva, the quarrelsome waters. So the second I see the word Meriva in the Gemara, and I think actually this is what sparked the whole share in my mind. I'm like, Meriva, Meriva, what's going on here? The only other word Meriva I know has to do with the with the waters and the well. So I feel like this is just my gut feeling is telling me that if Yeruvim's name comes from the word Meriva, quarrelsome, it's going to have something somehow to do with the quarrelsome waters. Okay. Yeah, so Moshe is punished for the May Meriva, for the quarrelsome waters, and Yeruvim is the the, the, or, the origin of that, or the, the deeper meaning behind that name is that Meriva, so we have the, the waters of Meriva, and we have Yeravim as Meriva, they must be connected in some way. And we don't see how they're connected. In Moshe, there's no water, he's told to speak to the rock, he hits the rock, and that's called the quarrelsome waters. Yeravim has a gripe with uh, with Solomon and, and the daughter of Pharaoh, and, and he breaks away, and he does idolatry, and his name and his identity is captured as Yeravam, which means Meriva. Somehow that's associated, you are telling us, that's associated with the quarrelsome waters of Moshe. Correct. Now, before we get to the May Meriva, just one more point. The Gemara tells us that the Gemara, right, so the Gemara um, right, tries to understand the word Yeravam, right? They try to interpret the word Yeravam to describe his essence. Then they move on to his father's name. Nevat. Nevat. It starts talking about Nevat. Yeravam ben Nevat. So who's this Nevat? Um, the Gemara says something mysterious. This Nevat is none other than Micha. Okay, Micha. Now, Micha is an interesting individual. We're taught that not this Micha... Not the prophet Micha. Someone else. Not the prophet... No. Absolutely not. Um, Micha... I, I'll, I'll read to you what Rashi says. Micha is a, a, the okay back in in the time of of the Exodus from Egypt. Okay, so there is this difficult conversation that Moshe Rabbeinu has with Hashem, and this is a very hard thing to understand. He comes after Moshe, I think, originally approaches Paro, and he's rebuffed. He, he he's and Paro increases the enslavement. Right, he makes things even more difficult for the Jewish people. So Moshe holds the ingredients for bricks and demands the same quota. And he and I actually I did not write this verse in my notes, and I wish I had it. It says Ume az basi al paro, and and then I went to paro, and I can't remember the the, the exact words. And then it says Lama harayos the lama said, Why have you been have bad? You made it worse. You've you made it worse. And he's talking to God. It, it's it's a it's kind of a hard. Hard conversation, like so, he's so Moshe burning bush. He's finally convinced to go to Pharaoh. He signs off with Yisro, with Jethro. He gathers the troops. He meets Aaron. They go to Pharaoh. They demand the release of the Jews, and Pharaoh starts laughing at them. And even though they do some miracles, instead of alleviating the state of the Jewish slaves, it gets worse. And Moshe comes back to God and says, "You know, you sent me to go save them, and instead of saving them, it actually got worse. And why did you?" make it worse for this nation. And the words that you're highlighting is, Ume'az basi al-paro. And from, from then, 
from that point that I came to Pharaoh, things got worse, not better. And, if, and then, of course, Moshe goes back a second time. This is at the very end of Parsha Shmos. For those of y'all who want to look it up, I think it's uh, the end of chapter five or the beginning of chapter six of the book of Exodus. Right. So Rashi tells us that Hashem responded to that argument. And Hashem said, you think I'm being bad? You think I'm being harsh? Well, let me tell you something. Oh, well, I mean, well, specifically, what Moshe was upset about was, uh, you know, the Egyptians were doing something horrible. They were taking Jewish babies and inserting them into the cement, which was then being, um, you know, used to create, to build walls. So they were Jewish babies. So if they were insufficient, if, they, if the Jews did not deliver the quota of bricks, then they would supplant the bricks with Jewish babies. Jewish babies. So Hashem says, all right, all right, you're upset at me. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to extract one of those babies. And I'm telling you that this is not, it's not going to have a happy ending. And it turns out that that baby that they extracted was Micha, who caused a lot of trouble for the Jewish people. He brought an idol with him uh, when they left Egypt. He crossed through the Amsa with the idol. And as we'll see later, he actually had to do with the golden calf. Um, he played a very important role in creating the golden calf, the one. And this is the father of Jeroboam. Okay, so, uh, you know, there's something chronologically doesn't make sense here because he lived when they left Egypt, right? Yeruvim is happening all the way down in the time of Shlomo HaMelech and Shlomo HaMelech's son. So I was very bothered by that question. What about it? And I looked it up and I found three answers. One of them is that he lived for a very long time. One of them is that we're, this is not really... Yeruvim's father is not Micha per se. It's a, a, a recarnation. I say Gilgal, a reincarnation, reincarnation of of that original Micha. So when the Gemara says that it's Micha, it's the same um, spiritual Micha. It might be different. Spiritual than Micha. And then the, this, those are both from the Benish Chai that I saw from the Vilna Gain from the Gra. I saw. I, I th- you know what? This is hard to understand. Is he a grandfather or a great grandfather? But it means the same so he says something. He says the something same mystical. Y chromosome. But but the the Vilna Gaon says something more mystical, which is that, which is that when it says that Micha crossed the Yamsuf, it means like the spirit of Micha. Meaning, you know, Micha really did live, um, you know, hundreds of years later, and he was the father of Yeravam. And when the Talmud tells us that Micha crossed the Yamsuf, it means the spirit of Micha crossed the Yamsuf. He actually is later, not earlier. But with the reason, regardless, I regardless, he, he regardless. is distributed in the Talmud, Yeravam, which we said is Mariva, which is a fight, which is a quarrel. His father is Nevat, and that is Micha. And, uh, the, spiritually, he is attributed to Micha. Micha, Nevat is Micha, which is, um, which is according to at least the sources, is the baby that Moshe spared, and uh, that redounded to his detriment. Correct. Okay, now, now we're going to go for the digression. We all know the story that Moshe um, and the, that the, the Egyptians were tossing Jewish babies into the river. And the reason they were doing that was because Paro's stargazers, they looked into the constellations and they saw that Moshe and Shal Yisrael, the savior of the Jewish people, will have his downfall in water. So they said, all right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to toss every single Jewish boy that's born into the water. And that way, we will have fulfilled this prophecy. And the whoever this potential savior is will have his downfall in the water. Great idea. So they did all this, including Moshe Rabbeinu. They threw Moshe Rabbeinu into the water. And sure enough, the, the next time the stargazers looked into the constellation, they said, all right, we succeeded. The uh, savior of the Jewish people is, he is done for. He's he already had okay. Now, the Talmud says that the stargazer made a mistake. Because it is true that Moshe Rabbeinu's downfall was water, but it was not his being thrown into the river. It was referring to a different water. It was referring to the main Mariva, which happened like some 80 years later. And it was the downfall, it was the spiritual downfall um, in, in which he, years later, because it was at the end of the forty years. Oh right, right. It's, it's, it's one hundred eighteen years later. One hundred nineteen. Okay, years. sorry. You're right. You're right. I, I missed that. Right. It was at the end of the forty years. Right. So the um, so it's, uh, it's over a hundred years later, and it's talking about you know not the not the physical drowning, 
but the spiritual downfall in which it was decreed upon him that he can't enter Eretz Yisrael and can't build a base in Mekka. Okay, so right. A few moving parts here. The Egyptians specifically chose the uh, the method of infanticide, of throwing the Jewish babies into the water. Why, why that? Because they had some sort of clairvoyant vision of the lead of the Jewish people being uh, suffering or being uh, uh, their downfall, the downfall of the, of the lead of Jewish people would be via water. And therefore they reasoned, okay, let's take all the babies that are in the water, and therefore the downfall of the leader will be in the water, and therefore they'll never have a leader that will lead them out of the land. And thus they chucked all the Jewish babies into the water. When Moshe was put in the water, he actually didn't die because he was he was in the water, but he was floating in the water. And they said, okay, well, it looks like uh, the leader of the Jewish people, we could see he's already in the water. And uh, therefore they they were calmed by the fact that they knew that there's no, no longer going to be a risk of the Jewish people getting out of Egypt. But they miscalculated or they misunderstood the the messages, so to speak, in the stars, in the constellations, because, yes, the leader of Jewish people will suffer at the hands of water, but it won't be as a baby being thrown into the water. It'll be as a very mature adult leader of the Jewish people. He's going to speak, or he was told to speak, but instead he's going to strike the water, strike the rock, and it will emit water, but that will be his downfall, meaning that is the sin that will prevent him from entering the land. Correct. Now, here's a question that has bothered me for quite some time. And that is, I'm no stargazer. Um, but I would imagine that, yeah? that... Does that surprise you? <laughs> no, I said you're a star. Superstar. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, you're no stargazer, but it seems like there's a problem. But it's, this seems problematic. Okay, because I would imagine that whatever messages the constellation send... These are authentic messages that somehow these constellations know what's going to happen. They actually, so these constellations were telling us that the savior of the Jewish people have his downfall in the water. They, these constellations were referring to the quarrelsome waters. Okay. The stargazers messed up. They said, toss him into the river because that's how they perceive the message. The next time they look at the stars, they say, Hey, we were right. We see that the savior of the Jewish people actually had his downfall. Now, my question to you, Rabbi Wobi, is that is not true. The savior of the Jewish people did not have his downfall because we know the truth. The truth is that it was referring to the May Mariva over 100 years later. So why were the constellations appeased? Why is it when the stargazers looked at this into the sky, they're like, we nailed it. We got it. They didn't get it. The constellations weren't fooled. Even if the stargazers could have been fooled, the constellations weren't fooled. So the messages still should have been coming. The, the savior of the Jewish people is still out there, still still hasn't had his downfall because in reality, he he did not. It still had over 100 years left. Well, okay. So I know you have a, probably a more sophisticated answer, but I, this question wouldn't bother me so much because the the whole notion of the clairvoyance of the stars, it's not precise and it's not clear by definition. And it is it is malleable. Uh, like, for example, uh, the, 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 the Pharaoh tells Jewish people, how could you go out? There's raw. There's, there's this, this constellation of blood. And they did the circumcision, and that was a way to kind of fulfill fulfill the uh, fulfill the um, prophecy, so to speak, of of blood, but in a uh, in a benign way. But I think that's just the nature of this form of prophecy. It's not clear. It's not accurate. It does give you red herrings. It does misdirect you, and therefore, it's not by definition. It's not supposed to be foolproof. And therefore, you put much in the water. Okay, that is a fulfillment, even though it actually isn't. Mm-hmm. All right, that's interesting. That is an interesting suggestion, and maybe you're right. Um, maybe you're right, but I, for the sake of the year, I spoke about this in some podcast, some sometime in the past. So that's what I remember uh, on this subject. That it, it does give you some sort of picture, but it's 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 murky, and it it it, uh, it it will not tell you exactly how it's applied. And you could apply it in a different way, and that will be a fulfillment, so to speak, of. Mm-hmm. of uh, that means there are multiple different ways that are, that are given prophecy, so to speak, in the stars can be actualized, can be realized. Okay, but mm-hmm. you have something okay, else. To- All right, so I'm just going to give an alternative suggestion, and that is somehow, some why, when they threw Moshe Rabbeinu into this water, his fate was sealed. The fate that he will ultimately stumble a hundred years later with the Memoriva has been sealed. So when he was thrown into that water, in fact, the constellation said, all right, he's done for. Okay, now how in the world that's true, that's what we're going to get into. That's going to be the crux of this year. But we're going to now connect 
what we're ultimately going to do is connect the water in which he was thrown into when he was an infant with the quarrelsome waters over 100 years later. Right? This whole show is a lot of water going on here. Yes. So what you're going to suggest is that the Stargazers Star got it right and that Moshe's actual downfall at the hands of the water was a product of Moshe's initial apparent downfall at the hands of the water when he's placed as an infant into the waters of um, of Egypt. Exactly. Do that. We are going to have to discuss another body of water. Well, actually, not another body of water. So it, it's actually that same body of water. But here's something fascinating. The Gemara and Sota... 12a, it's at the very bottom of 12a. So it's 12a and then it's followed by 12b. Discusses which water was this? It's right. The, the verse says um, when it says they threw him into the water, Vatosef, Vatosem, Ba Esayelet, Vatosem, Basuf. They placed him Basuf. I don't even, what's the literal translation of the word Suf? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. And, and maybe there isn't one because here's what the Talmud says. Points one opinion. It was the Amsuf. Okay, so there's lots of waters here. The impression that we have is that there's the Nile, the Nile River, and that's where the Egyptians were told or, or mandated that all the Jewish babies be thrown into the Yor, Hayyor Tashlichu. So that's the Nile River. But there's also another body of water known as the, the Yamsuf, the Sea of Reeds. I think it's the Red Sea, which is on the other side of Egypt. And what you're telling me is that Moshe was not placed into the Nile. And he was not extracted from the Nile by the daughter of Pharaoh. At least there's one opinion that tells us that he was placed in the Yam Suf because they placed him in Vatasim Basuf. He's placed in the Suf, which is the Yam Suf, which is not necessarily a generic generic term for water. It's a specific type of body or a name. It's a, it's a noun of Yam Suf, which is the same place that the waters split. Which is in, just incredible. So here, like Moshe Rabbeinu, he, his, in his infancy already, he's being exposed to the Yam stuff, which is going to have a very central role in his life many years later. But anyways, here, here's where things are going to st- get, start getting interesting. Let's fast forward. Hey, interesting. After all the podcast, all the listeners already <laughs> gave up on us. Now it's interesting. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, this should rejuvenate them. Um, let's go. Let's go. Let's move forward. To his, the next time Moshe Benu visits the Yam stuff. So he says, Oz Yashir Moshe, we all know this. Moshe Rabbeinu, he, the, the splitting of the sea happened, and in and, and his exuberance, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Oz Yashir Moshe, then Moshe sang, and Ubn Israel and all the Jewish people sang with him. Now, the Medrash tells us that there was something very significant about the expression, Oz Yashir Moshe, the word Oz, okay? And that is, that Moshe Rabbeinu said, I sinned the last time I said Oz, and now I'm going to atone for that sin, by saying us now. Now, when was the last time Moshe Rabbeinu said us? We mentioned it in passing earlier. When Moshe Rabbeinu spoke to Hashem, and he said, Ume us basi al paro, and he's complaining. He said, I went to, to Paro, and things only got worse because of that. So that was considered a sin, and the sin began with the word us. So that sin that Moshe Rabbeinu did, committed back then, was now being uh, atoned for, being remedied at the splitting of the sea. Very, very interesting. The Midrash is saying that the word us appears in two contexts, or at least there's more, because there's us yavdil, right? There's other uses. But the word us, which means then, which which then can mean at a given point, we don't know what then is, right? We don't know when, it just as then. But Moshe complains to God that ever since I went to Pharaoh, the conditions worsened, which was a sin because I actually know they were getting better. It was just not perceptible to Moshe. And now Moshe, again, this is sometime later, this is already after the Exodus, splitting of the sea, and the Egyptians are pummeled and swamped by the waters of the Yamsuf, of the Sea of Reeds, of the Red Sea, splitting of the sea. Now, Az Yashir Moshe, then Moshe sings or will sing and he's rectifying his sin of us with his song of us. Correct. Now, the next few lines in the Medrash tells us another fact about the word us. And they say the word us relates to the, none other than, the Dor Enosh. 
because the the term used in the verse when it discusses the sin of Enosh, Enosh's introduction of idolatry to the world, it says, Oz Puchal Enosh. Then Enosh, I guess, began. Um, it, 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 it's irrelevant. The point is, it uses the word Oz in, in, in the context of Enosh's sin with idolatry. Enosh, grandson of Adam, he is the one in his generation the devolvement of humanity and the adoption of idolatry began. And the way the verse describes it, and I have it over here, it's, he said it's Genesis, Gracious, chapter 4, verse 26. The verse says, Oz, hucha, Hashem. That's when they, they started to, uh, well, it simply means they to call the name of Hashem, but the commentaries tell us that's when they started to call to question the, the dominion of Hashem, so to speak. So we have Oz by Enosh, and we have us by Moshe's sin, and we have us now by the splitting of the sea. Correct. Now, what in the world does Enosh have to do with the splitting of the sea? How does he come into this? So the Medrash tells us um, that in retribution, in retribution for the for Enosh's sin, uh, God wiped them out with water. And and you mentioned that, that the earlier. First flood, flood one point Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Flood one point So the, and he wiped out. Uh, I think it was a third of humanity with that water. Okay, and the water of the Yamsuf was a remnant of that water. Okay, so the water, water comes in the times of Enosh and swamps a third of the world as punishment, as retribution for the sin of the generation of Enosh. And some of that water is still extant in the Yamsuf. Is that what you're telling me? I think so. I, I think that's what the Medrash is telling us. I'm just looking at the words again. Um, uh, it says, so he, he poured water upon the land. And now it has become an, an, an ocean. The, the land became an ocean. And that ocean became dry land for us. Okay, now, I, I would imagine that's what it's saying. Meaning, this ocean, this Yamsuf, it is that water that destroyed Enosh. And what happened, what's happening now before us in this I- I amazing miracle is that the, the very water that destroyed Enosh is now becoming dry. So a very, very deep point you're saying over here. We have the, the narrative of the flood of Noah. That's told you know, in, in great length in the Torah. Chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8. It's a very long story. And the, the the windows of the heaven open and the water from below and the 40 days and eventually the whole year and they sends out the raven and the dove. It's a whole long story. But when it ends, there is a drying. That the, 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 the waters are no longer present. The waters of Noah, they came, they did their damage or their cleansing, however you want to understand it. And then they went away. They the, uh, I think the verse says explicitly that the earth became dry. But you're telling me in the first flood, the flood of the time of Enosh, there was also water. It wasn't quite as comprehensive, the water. But when the flood 1.0 in the times of Enosh ended, it didn't have complete dryness. And some of that water coalesced in the same body of water that Moshe as a baby was placed in, and that now the nation is surrounded by, and the nation jumps in, and they split it, and it swamps the Egyptians. That same body of water, the Yamsuf, is a remnant, is a vestige, is left over from the first flood in the times of Enosh. That's what you're telling me. That's what I'm telling you. That, and which means that I'm going to just insert this here: that the spirit of Enosh somehow surrounds this, the Yamsuf until God splits it. Right when when God splits it, that's kind of the, the ultimate destruction of Enosh, uh, and, and that's part part of the great joy of the splitting of the Yamsuf is that Enosh has been uh, completely wiped off off the face of the earth. But until that happens. In the Yamsuf, there lives on the spirit and the um, and the idolatry of Enosh. So uh, again, I want to phrase it in a little bit different way. The the flood of Noah, flood two point it's more uh, defined. You have the flood, and then it lasts for a year, and then you have the drying. It starts, it ends. The flood of Enosh starred in the times of Enosh, and it didn't end until the splitting of the sea. Because there was still water from the flood of Enosh in the Yamsuf, meaning that whatever happened, whatever the function of the flood was to get rid of the influence of Enosh, that had not been completed 
until the splitting of the sea. The sea splits, and it's dry. And this is like the end cap. This is the conclusion of the flood of Enosh. Until then, there's still the water, and there's still the ongoing, so to speak, flood of the time of Enosh, and now it's ending. But beforehand, the Yamsuf, the, this body of water left over from the flood of Enosh, that is still, so to speak, trying to, or, or it's still influenced by the sin of Enosh, and that does not get rectified until splitting the sea. Correct. So just to recap, we have three uzes here, right? We have that the first uz being the, this referencing the sin of Enosh. The next uz we, uh, the next uz we meet is Moshe Benu's sinful uz when he says Ume uz basi paro, right? And he's complaining about um, the experience that he had with Paro and and the, the the intensified enslavement of the Jewish people. And then there's the third uz, which is a joyous uz, which is a rectifying uz with uz Yashiv. Okay, so those are the three uzes, and I'm going to attempt to put them together and, and demonstrate how they're all, all connected with each other. Okay. Um, okay, so let, let's recap. Right, we have Enosh, Uz, they get wiped out by the water. The Yamsuf is that very water that Enosh was wiped out with. Now, go back. Moshe Rabbeinu was thrown into the into the Yamsuf before it splits. Again, the Yamsuf has a little Enosh in it. Moshe Rabbeinu is tossed into the Yamsuf as a child, as an infant, before it splits. We do Moshe Rabbeinu is being exposed to Enosh at a very, very young, impressionable age. Do you understand? Enosh is there. Enosh lives on there. The Moshe idolatry of Enosh still courses throughout the Yamsuf, throughout this body of water. And Moshe is being submerged into it. So what you're saying is that this is not just, oh, uh, Moshe, he's a Jewish baby, and I want to kill the Jewish baby. Let's put it, let's hide him someplace. Oh, and that's what the stargazers observe, right? No, Moshe isn't in water. There's something deeply spiritual about, about these waters. These are not ordinary waters. This is the same waters of the time of Enosh. And they're still trying to wrestle with the idolatry of Enosh. And Moshe is placed into that. Moshe is submerged, so to speak, into the into the sea of Enosh, to the sea of idolatry that's left over from the times of Enosh. And that is what Moshe is exposed to and may be influenced by to a certain extent. And that's what the Egyptian stargazers see. I'm jumping the gun here, but that's what I imagine you're going to say. Yeah, yeah. We're going to say, and we're, what we're going to show is that um, this uh, Enosh factor that it, that Moshe Bain is being exposed to is ultimately what's going to lead uh, to the quarrelsome the sin by the quarrelsome waters, which is why the stargazers are are confusing the two. But we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. All right. So Moshe's act of striking the rock was an expression of the influences of Enosh that he picked up as a baby. Correct. Now, I'm um, obviously this is this is a big thing to suggest, uh, kind of creative. But I, I do have circumstantial evidence that Moshe Rabbeinu's um, experience in the in the Yamsuf as a baby was was spiritual, and that he was being what he was being exposed to was something uh, spiritually precarious, and that is the Zohar. The Zohar tells us this is in Chelik Beis, um page twelve uh, a. Everyone says, knows where the Zohar is. <laughs> it says, <laughs> it says um, that he hid. They hid Moshe Rabbeinu for three months, right? That's what the verse says. But it's Ehu Shlosha Yerachim. Which presumably means you know calendar months, month A, month B, month C. The Zohar tells us no; these are three spiritual months. This is the month of Teves, the month of Tammuz, and the month of Av. Right? Obviously, Tammuz and Av are two summer months. Teves is a winter month, so they're obviously not three consecutive not months. Clear. It's not continuous. Yeah, they're not continuous. So, what does it mean? I don't know what it means. I do know what Teves, Tammuz, and Av all have in common, and that is there's three fast days in them, each of them commemorating one stage of the destruction of the base of Mikdash, right? Tevis, there's the 10th day of Tevis, Aserah, but Tevis were fast because they surrounded the walls of Yerushalayim. Tamas has Shiva Aser, but that was the 17th day of Tamas when they broke through those walls. Av obviously has the 9th of Av when they destroyed the base of Mikdash. So we see from this Zohar already that Moshe Rabbeinu was being hid in some sort of dark spiritual reality that reflects the destruction of the base of Mikdash. So I feel at this point I have license to say that 
this this whole story of Moshe Rabbeinu being hidden away in in the water was something much deeper than what meets the eye. It was he's being submerged in some sort of spiritual negativity. Yeah, so this was not on your notes. At least I couldn't find it on the notes. I, I added it up. Mir Turful. So the three months, I just want to repeat it so I make sure I understand this. The three months that Moshe is in the water, it's not just you know three calendar months, it's three spiritual months, the three months that all have the events leading up to and culminating with the start of the temple. And if those are the three months, that means that that's the experience, so to speak, that Moshe is undergoing. He's undergoing or he's surrounded by the experience of the destruction. Correct. So here's what I want to suggest. Enosh is, the sin of Enosh um, is represented by the word us, right? That's what the, the Majors tells us. It says us by Enosh, that us was, was rectified by us Yasher. Okay, but Enosh is us. Moshe Rabbeinu is exposed to Enosh. The next thing we know, Moshe Rabbeinu is sinning with the word us. Meaning at the at the end of of Parsha Shmos, yes, where he tells he God, goes, he complains to God. Yes, complains to God. I want to suggest that the reason he sinned there was because of his exposure to Enosh. Again, Enosh is they're, they're the masters of idolatry. God forbid to suggest that Moshe Rabbeinu had anything to do with idolatry, but there was some there was some influence, and Moshe Rabbeinu's. I don't even know how to say this. I don't. I don't want to say anything negative about Moshe Rabbeinu. But there, there was some, something happened. Something went awry. He shouldn't have complained to God. And he did. And I want to suggest that that, that was be, because of that influence from Enosh. Had he not been exposed to that as an infant, he would not have sinned by saying, Ume az basi al paro, complaining that uh, his experience with paro um, was, was negative. And we, we do say, know that that was a sin. The Midrash does say that explicitly that, that was a sin of Moshe. And he's trying to rectify for it, right? He's right, right. I, I just, I just don't want anyone listening to this to say Moshe Rabbeinu had anything to do with idolatry. God forbid to suggest such a thing. It's just that you know they, we do know this idea that when someone sins, it it, it does have some sort of, of it, it has some sort of um, um, scintilla of of a rejection of God to a certain extent, obviously, you know, to Moshe's extent. We love to be, Mo, this. Our Moshe's sins will be our mitzvah. So let me make that yeah, clear. Right, right. <laughs> we'll take any one of Moshe's sins as a mitzvah. I will happily adopt them. <laughs> um, so but, so, I mean, so but, right now what we're doing, we're connecting these two uzes, this uz of Enosh and the uz of Moshe, the first uz of Moshe Rabbeinu, um, both have, uh, both share the same source. Yes. And both of them are rectified um, by the splitting of the sea. Yes. Um, all right. Fine. So now let's get back to the Memoriva and ultimately uh, Yerovah. But let's talk about the Memoriva right now. Okay, the quarrelsome waters. So we know what Moshe Rabbeinu did. He was supposed to talk to the, he was supposed to talk to the, um, the well, the rock, and he, and he hit the rock. My agenda right now is to show that his hitting the rock, that sin also comes from the same source. So again, we said Enosh, he was exposed to Enosh. That led to the sin of saying, Ume az basi al paro. The next sin, so to speak, that we know of is Moshe Rabbeinu was sinning by, by the, the quarrels and waters, by the main mariba. And I'm going to suggest that that also shares the same, uh, the same source. The same thread is going to be woven throughout all three. Okay, but wait a minute. So what you're saying is that when the sea split, it didn't completely, and Moshe, of course, was seen as Yashir, that didn't completely cleanse every remnant of the influence of Enosh and the influence of the original us. Even subsequently, even almost 40 years later, Moshe hits the rock as opposed to speaking to it. And that is somehow related to the sin of Enosh. Okay, so and we're, we're, I am saying that. I'm I'm specifically saying that I'm going to explain it. I'm going to explain soon why the Yamsuf didn't completely eradicate the sin of Enosh because something something well, went wrong. Of the Yamsuf, something went wrong with the Yamsuf. Ah, uh, that's where Micha comes in. <laughs> the father of the uh, uh, clever, clever. <laughs> whose name is Mariva. Yeravam comes to Oh, wow, 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 wow. 
Okay. You got this. I didn't get to that part of the notes, but all right, you got yeah. <laughs> that, and that's what God tells him: you're in trouble. Like you're you're asking for trouble by trying to rescue this Micha guy because he's going to torpedo this amazing cleansing of the spinning of the sea uh, by bringing some idolatry there and thus allowing some of the spirit of Enosh to live on. Perfect. And that's going to affect you in a very big way because you're going to strike the rock and be barred from entering the land. Exactly. Sorry for stealing your thunder, but I just... I, no, 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 you're not stealing my thunder. It's good. And also, you're, you're helping me because I, I honestly, I, I, can't, I can't even remember where I'm going with all this. Um, all right. So how are we going to connect the main Mariva to this whole story? Here And here is my favorite part of the year. Okay. The... There's a verse in Tehillim, okay, um, 43, chapter 40, verse 3, that says, uh, it's not really important what it, what it says, it just says, okay, mi bar sha'on. It makes a reference to a a, um, a bar, is a cistern, a pit, sha'on. Okay, bar sha'on. Whatever that means. Says the great Kabbalist, the Rama mi panu. That the word Sha'om is the same letters as the word Enosh. You hear that? Okay, so the word... There's this pit. There's this cistern of Enosh. Okay. The Ramami Panu tells when, us this. When the verse in Psalm says that you have taken me out of the pit of Sha'on, it's actually... Th- those words have st- are scrambled. Sha'on is Shin, Aleph, Vav, Nun. But it's also the same letters. If you were to write them differently, it would be Aleph, Nun, Vav, Shin, which is Enosh. Correct. So what the psalmist is actually praising God is that you have taken me out. You have extricated me from the pit, from the cistern of Enosh. Correct. Okay. Now, it happens to be that the Ramami Panu is referencing a, a different verse um, that says the word Sha'on. But the, another great Kabbalist, or Mendel of Shklov, he's a great student of the Vilna Gom, he says it in regarding to this verse. The Bar Sha'on is the, the pit of Enosh. Now, what does that mean? And he explains. He says that there's a term Boros Nishbarim, the broken cisterns. And that and that is a metaphor somehow for idolatry. And he says that Enosh, who introduced idolatry to the world, they dug this first bore, this first pit, this first pit of evil water, of idolatry. And he says from then on, Um, Subsequent to that, there were seven generations, all of whom were idolaters. Enosh is the grandson of of Adam. So the seven generations later, that would be Noah. That would be the times of Noah. Uh Right, right. And they succeeded in um, the the Shekhinah, the divine present, removing itself uh, seven times upwards towards the, the, the highest heaven, meaning the, the Shekhinah was removed from this world seven times over because of these boros, these pits of Sha'on, of Enosh. So we did this terrible pits of idolatry and one pit, tooth pit, you know, all the way down to seven pits. And with, with every time that we degrade and we go lower, God correspondingly moves away, so to speak. So he was here, but then he went up one level as we dug one level. And then we dug a second level and he goes up a second level and so on until we're seven pits down on the ground and God is, so to speak, seven realms up in heaven, away from us. Correct. Now we know um, in the parsh, the upcoming parshiyos, we're going to see a lot of this, um, a, a lot of wells that that that, that, that the patriarchs dug, right? Avram Avinu digs wells. Yitzchak Avinu digs wells. I don't know that we find Yaakov Avinu digging wells. Um, we do find that Yaakov Avinu um, he met his wife Rachel. He removes uh, the well. cork. He removes the cork from the well, right? He removes the cork from the well. Exactly. Right. So there's a lot of wells going on. So it says the Rebbe of Shklov, that the wells contrast the pits. It's like bor, cistern, versus be'er, wellspring. And he says that each well that we dug rectified one cistern that they dug. I'll just read you his words. This is the elevating the waters to their source, the living, the source of living water. And that is the, the digging of the wells um, to in order to bring, um, to take the boar and turn it into a bear. Okay, so the digging of the wells, remember there were seven, seven cisterns, and then there's going to be seven wells to contrast that. Okay, so, so that's the rectifying of the pits 
the seven pits from Enosh uh, onward, and then we're fixing it with seven uh, wells, and I guess also the other uh, symptoms, the other byproducts of the the pit. Like we said, every time you dig a pit, God goes up one level, distances himself, so to speak, his divine presence from us. By digging a cistern, by transforming a pit, a bar into a air, a pit into a into a, into a well that also brings down, so to speak, the divine presence back really where it belongs uh, in this world. Correct. Now we know that Moshe Rabbeinu is the seventh generation from Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu was the first well. Moshe is going to be the seventh generation because it's Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and Yaakov's son Levi, Levi's son Kahas, Kahas' son Amram, and then Moshe. So we and have seven fact, generations, uh, Abraham to Moshe, and those are the seven wells to fix the seven cisterns, the seven pits from Enosh all the way to the times so, of. Okay, so Rabbi Wolby, nobody says that. Nobody says that specifically, that that chain uh, of lineage is what fixed the seven, uh, these, these, these seven cisterns of evil. I'm suggesting it. I'm going to suggest that. I'm going to suggest that Moshe Rabbeinu was charged with the responsibility to finish the job. He's the seventh. Remember, Avraham Avinu was the first of the wells. Of Moshe Rabbeinu is seven generations down the road. Moshe Rabbeinu's job was to, to dig the seventh well and eradicate Enosh off the planet of this earth. Well, I'm just, I'm looking at, I'm looking at your notes. It does kind of say it. If you put the Remendel of Shklov together with the with the Midrash, because Remendel of Shklov compares the elevation or the 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 removal of the divine presence seven levels, and he compares that to the seven pits, and then we see the Midrash that says that the bringing back the drawing back of the divine presence seven levels was done by these seven subsequent um, luminaries: you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Levi, Kahas, Amamosha, and then you can imagine that, well, if that is connected, if the if the elevation, if the removal of divine presence is connected to this uh, system of, of seven pits, then we can surmise that the seven, uh, that these seven levels also restored the seven, um, filled up, so to speak, rectified the seven pits with the seven, uh, with the seven wellsprings. Correct, you're correct. So it's very, it's very logical what I'm saying. You know, you put this measures that Rabbi, what we just mentioned I'm, together. I'm just saying, uh, if if I was in your place, I would say it was so much more confidence. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'd say, well, this is what it says. <laughs> I'll pick you back up your confidence. So, okay, so we, when was Moshe Rabbeinu supposed to dig this well? Which well are we referring to? Which well was the well that was supposed to eradicate Adam off the face of this earth? I will humbly suggest that it was the well of the main Mariva, the one that he was supposed to speak to and thus, all kinds of beautiful spiritual water would have emerged. That would have been this, the most seminal moment in history. That would have been the moment in which Enosh uh, evaporates from the face of this earth. There's no more Enosh. There's no more Abu Dazara. We live in a pure, pristine world. Had Moshe Rabbeinu carried out the command um, as it should have been done. So what you're saying is that if 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 Enosh is the first of seven pits... And Moshe is the last of seven wells, and Moshe corresponds to Enosh. Correct. And therefore, if he had done it properly, it's spoken to the well as, as opposed to striking it, then that would have completely sealed off any remnant of, of Enosh and uh, and thus eliminated the influences of idolatry forever. And thus Moshe would have entered the land and built a temple and Messiah and everything would have been, all of human history subsequently would have been different. Okay, so why did he fail? Why didn't he do it? Well, wait, uh, let, let me just pause a little bit. What about the first well in in, uh, in Mara? Or what about the, the, the time in Rafitim where he was told to strike the... Right. Uh, I, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, I think... Maybe all of that were elements of getting rid of the... the, the maybe well, it was elements. I mean... Of- a bit of, you have to understand, uh, so obviously there was there was a difference between those wells because this well was, it was like the Torah makes a much bigger deal out of this one. It was like Laman, Lohemantam be you didn't believe me and, and you didn't sanctify my name. Like there was a lot that was depending on this final well. We don't really find such an emphasis on, on the, the previous ones. That's a good question. But that's what I want to suggest. I want to suggest the final well that would have done the job would have been this well, and there was a and something went off, something went already there. So my question to you is, everyone will be, based on what we've learned so far, why did Moshe Rabbeinu mess up? 
Why didn't he speak to the well and just get the job done? Well, you, you already said that there's some sort of remnant of Enosha's influence that wasn't rectified with, this, with the splitting of the sea, with the drying of the waters of Enosha, as you told us it uh, it was. There's still some sort of influence, some sort of remnant, a vestige of Enosh still existed. That's what you're going to say, I predict. That is what I'm going to say. And when I say that, one of our big questions is answered. Now we understand exactly what was going on in those constellations. The constellations were predicting the May Mariva, that Moshe will fail by the May Mariva. The moment he was placed in the Yamsuf, they were appeased. Why? Because the moment he was placed in the Yamsuf, the May Mariva happened. Conceptually, he was his fate was sealed. He had the exposure to Enosh, and that would disable him from eradicating Enosh 100 years later by the May Mariva. So it's one and the same thing. Being placed in the Yamsuf is the same thing as the sin of the May Mariva, and that's why the stargazers looked in the constellations. They said that the savior of the Jewish people has had his downfall because, in fact, he did. They got it right. They got it right. But again, according to what you're saying, they could have done it wrong had Moshe not taken Micha with him. <laughs> exactly. So let's get to that. Um, Remember, a lot of this year is supposed to talk about Yerovim, so we haven't we haven't got to Yerovim yet. And also, um, like you just asked, wh- why? By the, we, we were taught that the Kriyas Yamsov, the the waters of Enosh dried up, and they they should have been eradicated. So let's answer both of those questions together. Where does Yerovim come into this? And why was the sin of Enosh not completely eradicated by the Yamsov? Okay. Remember that when Moshe Rabbeinu came to Hashem, he said, Ume uz basi paro. He sinned with the word uz. And, and the word uz relates to Enosh. The next line Moshe Rabbeinu says is this line that, that Hashem gets upset. He says, Lama hariosa, la Why did you um, make things difficult for this nation? Hashem responds, All right, um, you know, one baby will be saved, will be spared, and that baby is Micha. Micha brought idolatry into the Yamsuf. It says that explicitly. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, sorry, I should have quoted it to you. It says a pasuk ve'aver bayam tsara, and and a um, a difficulty, a hardship crossed the sea. And Rabbi Yochanan says this is the idolatry of Micha. Means it, it stresses, if I can say, if I could kind of accentuate the point. Micha was a rotten apple. It would have been better for him to have not uh, left the uh, the concrete of 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 Egypt, right? And the problem, the 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 verse and the sages, they emphasize that, that the problem was not just that he had idolatry, but specifically idolatry came through the Yamsuf. It, it it was part of the the assets of the nation as they crossed through the Yamsuf, through the splitting of the sea. It doesn't it doesn't it highlights the fact specifically that the idol came with them through the splitting of the sea. It doesn't even mention the idol came out of Egypt or the idol was with them in the wilderness. It just says specifically at the point of the splitting of the sea. The idol was there. And the right. just emphasized that for a reason, because that is what limited the full effect of the spin of the sea to eradicate the influence of Enosh. Okay, yeah, you're so you jump ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's worth pointing out that that um why is it specifically in context of splitting the sea that we learn about the uh, idolatry of, of Micha? Could have just said when they left Egypt. Right. Okay, so here's here's the, the deep, deep uh the deep idea I want to suggest. It wasn't random that Hashem says to him, Okay, you're upset at me. Go take a baby out, and guess what? That baby ended up being Micha. I mean, why couldn't it have been some other baby? Like, like, like what, what was God doing to, to Moshe Rabbeinu? It was some sort of shtick? Like, you know, you think I'm being evil? All right, so take one baby, and haha, I know that that baby will be bad. No, 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 no. That's not what was going on. When Moshe Rabbeinu said, Umi az basi paro, that complaint was, was a little bit affected by the idolatry of Enosh. The moment he did that, he brought some some of that effect into the world that birthed Micha. That birthed Micha, who was the one who brought idolatry, who was the great idolater. Moshe transferred when he said us, may us basia paro, which is again an expression that was used for the first time in the times of Enosh. 
uh, which is the inception of idolatry in the world. That statement was conferred, so to speak, to Micha, and it was given like a home, so to speak, in Micha, and that led to him bringing out the idolatry. <laughs> and that's why specifically it mentioned idolatry in the context of the splitting of the sea, because the splitting of the sea was supposed to rectify Enosh. And now Enosh himself is crossing the sea via Micha, via that sin of Uz. So in other words, Moshe Rabbeinu was supposed to rectify the Uz of Me Uz Basil Paro when he said Uz Yashir. But that Uz itself was living on in the form of Micha crossing the sea. So the entire effect of the splitting of the sea was now diluted or mitigated to a degree. It's tarnished. Yeah. The yeah. That someone with you know, the force of Enosh was still was still alive and well inside Micha. Thus, the effect of the splitting of the sea was not complete. Thus, the name Mariva occurred. Thus, Yeruvim's name comes from the word Mariva because Yeruvim is the son of Micha. He's the son of Nevat. So his entire essence is it was birthed by the one who caused the May Mariva to happen. Because in the end of the day, it all comes to Micha. Because Micha is the one who stopped the Yamsuf from having its full effect, which ultimately led to the May Mariva, which ultimately led to the, the death of Moshe Rabbeinu and his inability to enter Eretz Israel. So there's this like virus, the virus of Enosh, and it gets stronger with seven generations. And comes along Abraham and starts to fix it. And he fits one realm and two realms and three realms. Seven realms. But there's a little tiny bit of that virus that's still alive. And that's the Me'az Basi El Paro. And that's in Micha. And that's by the splitting of the sea. And that is by the Memriva. And that really comes to full expression. By Yeravam, the Mariva, the son of Nevat, the son of Micha. And now suddenly we have a whole idolatrous temple. And the the the, the golden calves are resurrected. And uh, somehow the spirit of Enosh has been maintained. It, it, the little flicker of Enosh was not stamped out. And now we have this terrible forest fire of Enosh in the times of Yeravim. Correct. And worth remembering, um, and this will come up towards the end, that Micha was also uh, crucial in the creating of the eagle, of the golden calf. And you could already see why this is relevant, because Yeravim, who comes from Micha, is also going to erect the golden calf. So the, the golden calf thing runs in the family. Yes. Okay. Now we're we're got we're we're coming to we're, we're getting near the end. We began this year. One of the things we began with was with Shlomo Melech and this seemingly very very petty disagreement with Yeravim. Shlomo Melech marries this daughter of Paro. Um, Yeravim, he charges a tax. Yeravim is really angry about it. He wants this Bas Paro out of here. Just get her out of here. We we don't need, you know, we're not paying a tax for her. Um, he doesn't say get Bas Paro out of here. He just doesn't want to be accommodating her. Um, and, and to the point where he just breaks off of the, the Davidic kingdom. And next thing you know, he's erecting golden calves. It's, it's totally bizarre. Completely, you know, beyond comprehension what's going on there. So we're going to try to explain it. With the Arizal. The Arizal points out that Shlomo Amalekh was a nitzot, a spark of Moshe Rabbeinu. If you think about it, the word Shlomo and Moshe are almost the same. And I've seen, and I, I don't have this in my notes, that the word Shlomo is actually the letters Le Moshe. He's, he's like attributed to Moshe. He's working towards something that Moshe Rabbeinu represented or something that Moshe Rabbeinu lacked. Shlomo's entire mission in his life was to, to pick up from where Moshe Rabbeinu left off. Shlomo le Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, Shlomo Melech is a spark of Moshe Rabbeinu. The wisest okay. of all men emanates spiritually from the humblest. Interesting. That's a nice way of putting it. He marries the daughter of Pharaoh. Who is this? He says this daughter of Pharaoh that he marries is a Gilgal, a reincarnation of Basia, who is also the daughter of Pharaoh, who extracted Moshe Rabbeinu from the water. So Moshe, the original Moshe, he has an association with the daughter of Pharaoh because that's his adopted mother. She's the one who pulls him out of the Yamsuf. Shlomo, who is also associated with some sort of spark, some sort of emanation of Moshe, again, like he pointed out, the letters Moshe and the, letters, and the word Shlomo, it's this, almost the same, you know, just with the extra, extra Lamed. Um, Shlomo also, he, he has an association, a deep 
intimate association with the daughter of Pharaoh, not the original daughter of Pharaoh, but the new version of the daughter of Pharaoh, and he marries her, and that is somehow associated with this whole process. Now, um, what, what does that mean? So the result tells us that this Basio, who extracted Moshe Rabbeinu from the water, she saved him. You know, we, we see her as, as a very, very righteous woman. She, you know, she saved Moshe Rabbeinu, and that is true. That is true. She was. Right? We name, they're, they're Jew, it's a Jewish name, right? Basio, many, um, it's a Jewish female name is Basio. So we name after her. She was a righteous woman. However, he, so as a result, there was something bad about her. There was a Rasheba. There was a little badness still in her. And Shlomo Amalek, Want by marrying her, hoped to remove that bad or create, correct that bad, transform it into good. That's what Shlomo sought to do by marrying Baspal. Shlomo wanted to rectify whatever leftover flaws were present in the daughter of Pharaoh that were not fixed, so to speak, in the original daughter of Pharaoh. He wanted to fix it with his wife, the daughter of Pharaoh. Correct. Now, I, I forgot to mention something very important, which is that Shlomo married the daughter of Pharaoh. That was on the night that he inaugurated the Beis HaMikdash. This okay. is not, uh, like you said, he's very, very talented, very wise. This is not something that he's just doing uh, on a whim. There's some sort of very deep calculation behind it. So he's connecting the building of the temple to... Wait, the night that he built the temple, that he inaugurated. I know. I was just trying to look back. I don't know. It's the night he built it or the night he inaugurated. It, either way, it, the verse says it explicitly. Uh, I think it says that the, the night he built it. At, at the beginning of the temple, Solomon marries the daughter of Pharaoh in an effort, in an attempt to fix or to rectify whatever spiritual flaws were still present from the original daughter of Pharaoh who saved Moshe, adopted him, and raised him. So let me ask you a question, Abubi. Why does Shlomo care that Basia, who who saved Moshe being from the water, that she had some evil in her? I mean, who cares? She's dead. Like, what? what, what why is that relevant? What would be his motivation? I, well, what would be his motivation? He thought that if there's a way to get rid of this influence... That would usher in, you know, that would fix what we tried to fix one, one time before. This would be like another version, I guess, of a spinning of the sea and to finally get rid of idolatry in the world and bring the world to its perfection. I would imagine something along those lines. Correct. So here's what I think. Remember, Moshe Rabbein was in the Yamsuf. The Yamsuf, which before pre-splitting was full of Enosh stuff, full of Avodazara stuff. Basia, her job wasn't simply to... Um, to, to save his life, it was to remove him from from that Enosh environment. It was she was charged with the, the most um, with the most important responsibility in the world. She had to get Moshe Rabbeinu away from all the spiritual negativity of Enosh in order to become Moshe Rabbeinu. And he had to get out of there, and Basia was the one chosen to do that. Now, if there's a little bad in her, if there's a little Rasha Ba, as the result says. She can't do that, at least not not fully. She can't fully remove Moshe Rabbeinu from the bad of Enosh if she herself has some bad in her. Thus, that little Enosh factor that's been following us all around, that ultimately led to Moshe Rabbeinu not being able to enter Israel, not being able to build the base of Mikdash. Shlomo, many years later, whose letter, whose word, whose name is the letters Le Moshe. He's trying to pick up the pieces from where Moshe Rabbeinu left us off, a failure to build the base of Mikdash. He wants to now build the base of Mikdash. The one thing he's got to do is get rid of that bad of Basia, because that's what led to the whole problem. Had Basia not had bad in her, she would have been able to fully remove Moshe Rabbeinu from the Yamsif. Moshe Rabbeinu would have no Enosh in him. He would not have sinned by saying, Basia al Paro. Micha would not have been born. Micha would not have followed him through the Yamsif. He would not have sinned with the Meim Riva, and he would have entered Eretz Yisrael building the Mikdash. Shlomo Melech has to fix all of that by rectifying the bad within Basia. <laughs> Wowza. Wowza. <laughs> I love that. That was great. So Basia's mission to extract Moshe was not done perfectly well because Moshe was not fully extracted. Why? Because Basia herself 
was guilty of the same crime that she's trying to save Moshe from. She too is influenced by Enosh, and that's why Moshe has a little bit of leftover Enosh within him, whatever, whatever that means. And then he does the same, which leads to this whole cascading series of events, this whole sequence of events, which leads to terrible things. And Shlomo is aware of that, and on the night that he builds the temple, he says, okay, we're going to finally fix this flaw in the daughter of Pharaoh, and thereby will lead to the full extrication of Moshe, so to speak, from the waters of Enosh, and therefore will actually forestall all the problems that are about to come, namely the, the Meimariva and the Yeravam and the Micha and the idolatry and the golden calves of all sorts. Correct. Now, just to point out one thing, remember I mentioned the Zohar says that the three months that he was hidden in the waters, the three months that relate to the Chorba and Mesa Mikdash, right? Teves, Tamos, and Av. According to the above, it makes a lot of sense because it was this experience that really led to Moshe Benu not building a base of Mikdash. Had Moshe Benu built the base of Mikdash, it would have lasted eternally, that we know this. So it's because of his experience in the water that the Chorban, the destruction of the temple, happened. That's why he's. it's those three months that he's being... That's why the three months that he's there is the three months of destruction. And that could not have been eliminated by Basia pulling him out because she herself suffers from that malady. Correct. Now, who doesn't like Basparo? Who's the one who doesn't like Basparo? Who wants? Who doesn't like this whole plan? Yeravam. Because Yeravam comes from that same exact spark of bad that Basya has in her, right? That badness of Basya is the badness that didn't remove Moshe Benin from Enosh. It's that little spark of Enosh. Again, Enosh is Avodazara. Which I, I, I should have mentioned, the, the Talmud actually tells us that Basya went to the water. Lirchot migilule avihosh. She wanted to, to remove all the idolatry from her, i.e. she wanted to convert. Obviously, she didn't fully convert, and therefore there was a little idolatry left in her. A little bit of Enosh left in her, which, in, which disabled her from removing Moshe Rabbeinu from the Enosh that he was exposed to which led ultimately to the birth of Micha, to the birth of Yeravim. So Yeravim, there's something about Yeravim that says, I don't want the evil in Basia to be eradicated, because that's my whole existence. I'm born when from... Lomo set up uh, the the taxes or whatever he did that raised Yeravim's ire, what was really... What, what the real conflict was is that Shlomo understood a way to cleanse the daughter of Fowler from the uh, Enosh malady, from the Enosh virus, and Yeravim is fighting against that because he is the expression, the full expression of Enosh via Micha, via the golden calf. He is in stark opposition to the plan of Shlomo. Correct. Now let's go back to all our questions. We began by saying that the Mabel, right, Mabel 2.0, um, began in the month of Cheshbon. And we mentioned how Rashi tells us that uh, the, the, the God ag- agreed with those who said, Ma Enosh ki says Kirano, let's wipe uh, Enosh off the face of this earth. And the Ramban questioned this, he's saying, but God's plan was not to wipe humanity off the face of this earth um, because he wanted to salvage Noah. So this is not my idea. I saw this quoted um, from two heavy hitters, the Shla and the Maharsha, they both say that when it says enosh ki says kerenu, it's not referring the word enosh, which, which could be translated as humanity. It's referring to enosh specifically, the generation of enosh, the evil of enosh, the concept of enosh. So, so when Rashi says that God wanted to destroy all of enosh off the face of the earth, he meant um, the door enosh, the, the idolatry of enosh. Okay, so that answers the Ramban's question because he never meant that he wants to. Uh, wipe humanity off the face of this earth. He only meant he, he wanted to wipe Enosh, the door Enosh, the generation of Enosh off the face of the earth. Okay. Meaning that the, the seven layer layers of degradation that Enosh started, and then after seven, seven generations you have Noah, the process of the flood is going to be a version of fixing all those pits, fixing all those degradations. Correct. He chose which month to do this in? The month, month of judgment. judgment. Okay, now, why he chose the month of Cheshvan, I don't know. But what I do know is, obviously, the month of Cheshvan is the month in which we destroy Enosh. That's the month that God chose to destroy Enosh. Now, what happens? 
I, I hear I, I'm a little vague. All I know, and Rabbi Wilby, maybe you spoke about this on a podcast. Something went wrong with the Mabel. Noah was supposed the world was supposed to be absolutely cleaned, cleansed. Um, following the Mabel, there should be no more evil left. Now we know current events tell us that there's plenty of evil left in the world. Um, so what went wrong? Something in the Teva experience went wrong. Two things I could think of. The, the two sins were uh, Cham, one of Noah's sons, Cham sinned. And also we know the O-Rave, the Raven sinned. Okay, so there are two. Can I, can I add another suggestion? Yes. There was Og clinging to the outside. Interesting. So this Maybe. is like a little bit, because we know that Moshe is trying to f- wage a war against Og. Oh, against Og, that's fascinating. And Og is always trying to... Uh, cause problems and he he obviously stands for idolatry and he was he was holding on to the ark the midras tells us from the outside and uh and that kind of it didn't complete the the cleanse so to speak of uh of of all the enosh factors so we're left with a little Gosh, only the end of his life destroys oak right okay that's very, that's very interesting so we have to look into if there's a connection between Og and, and Yeravim. <laughs> but but basically there's there's this little Enosh that that remains after the Mabel that should not have remained. Now, we know that Noah, the um how do I know this? I think the Medrash tells us this specifically, or or at least the Rambam tells us this, that the place where Noah landed, where the Teva landed, was the Har Hamoria, where the base of Mikdash was built. So meaning what was really, I think, what, what this means is what was really supposed to happen was the world is completely cleansed of Enosh and the base of Mikdash is built. Meaning it, it's an equation. When Enosh is gone, the base of Mikdash is built. Okay, so Enosh was supposed to be completely eradicated in the month of Cheshvan and then a year and change later, base of Mikdash built. Now, I don't know if the Teva itself that's would the, have been the base the of Mikdash. That's the connection between Noah and Moshe, all the many connections that Noah was supposed to serve just as Moshe was as the builder of the temple, kind of to signify the destruction of Enosh. Right, right, exactly that. And he failed, again, because Enosh continued to live on somehow. And so what happens is the next time around, Shlomo HaMelech completes the building of the base of Mekdash in which month? Month of Cheshvan. Month of Cheshvan, of course. Because that's the month in which Enosh is supposed to be eradicated. And what does he do? Oh, so here I, I do want to suggest that it's the month that he actually built it. Because what does he do immediately? He marries Basparo in an effort to eradicate Enosh. Because he knows that the success of the Beis Mikdash is contingent on the eradication of Enosh. It failed in the time of the Mabel, but let's get it right this time. Beautiful. That's why it says that he built the Beis Mikdash in the month of Bull, which means Mabel. Remember, we asked, like, okay, I get it. He built it in Cheshvan, which is the month of the Mabel. But, but Cheshvan is also a month of other things. Like, why are you bringing the Mabel in now? Why are you saying that the month that someone else built the base of is the month of the Mabel? The answer is, of course, that's the whole thing. You build the base of Mikdash in the month that the Mabel happens. Because when Enosh gets destroyed, that brings about the base of Mikdash. So when I talk about Shlomo building the base of Mikdash, the only relevant fact about Cheshvan in that context is the fact that it's a month of the Mabel. Now, I don't have this in my notes, but what I think is, why say bull? Why don't say Biyarach Mabel? Biyarach Mabel, in the month of the Mabel. Why say Biyarach Bull? So the Medjur actually asked this question. Um, I don't remember its, its answer, but I want to suggest maybe because the whole point is that the Mabel failed. Right, the Mabel should have done the job and it didn't. So maybe like there's something lacking in the Mabel. We're not going to call it Mabel. We're going to call it Bull because the Mabel wasn't complete. Okay. Take that for what it's worth. So have we answered all our questions yet? Um, we we ask why why um what does it mean that Hashem wanted to wipe all of humanity off the face of this earth? Um, by the Mabel, the answer is it doesn't mean all of humanity, it means all of Enosh. Can we answer that question? We asked why it is. That um that the base of Mikdash was built in the month of Cheshvan and why it's called Yerech Bol. We answer that question. You build a base of Mikdash in the month of Cheshvan because that's the month when Enosh gets eradicated. It's called the Yerech Bol because the whole point of the the um the opportunity of Cheshvan is because it's the month of the Mabel. That's the month when we can get rid of Cheshvan. 
we explained um, what Shlomo Alech was doing with Bas Paro and what the depth of Yeravam's um, with the, what the Yeravam's So we did not yet explain why and why um, Yeravim built the golden calf specifically in the month of Cheshvan, but I think it's obvious at this point. Remember, Yeravim, the golden calf runs in the family. It's it, it was it, Micha was the one who built the golden who created the golden calf. At least he was uh, played a, a critical role. And in the month of Cheshvan, when they're trying to get rid of Enosh, he goes ahead and says, "No, you no, you don't. I'm going to build the golden calf. I'm going to continue the legacy of Enosh in the month of Cheshvan because that's when you're trying to get rid of it." Um, I will point out. So the both word. sides of this cosmic battle of 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 the proponents and the opponents of of Enosh are both rising up in this month to wage war. Who's going to win? That's why the temple's being built and uh, and the the mabul, the floods happening, all that in the month of Cheshvan to kind of eliminate Enosh comes along the other side and says, okay, now we're going to reinforce the spirit of Enosh. We're going to build the golden calf to thwart, so to speak, your attempts at eliminating the influence of Enosh. Correct. Correct. I just had to end at the end of my notes. I wrote that the word Bastia is the letters Teva and the letters Habayas. Um, so Habayas, like, is the base of Mikdash. The Al Habayas Hagodava Kodesh is base of Mikdash. Can I add one more thing here? I don't have finish your point. But and, and also the Teva, which was supposed to be the base of Mikdash, so it's, it's also come, all but, comes down but to But also Bastia. the word Teva applies by Moshe. Moshe was placed oh, that's in the right. Table. He's placed in the Teva. Okay. Only, I think the only two times that it says the word Teva in the Torah is the Ark of the Ark of Noah and a little mini Teva of Moshe. That's great. That's great. Exactly that. Because the Teva is what, is what like removes you from the world of Enosh. You live in that little Teva. You're untainted by Enosh. That's what they're trying to do. That's amazing. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't think of that myself. They'll leave me something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Absolutely uh, magnificent. I, can I add another few thoughts that I had over here? Sure. So, um, I always struck me that um, we have this encounter with Basia, right? Basia, daughter of Pharaoh, but there's someone else present, right? Who else is present? That's Miriam. And we know that the the thing that Moshe is trying to, the, the main Mariva was about the well of Miriam. Wow. Amazing, amazing. So, so she was like there. Basia, she was like Basi does the imperfect conclusion of Moshe's teva, right in the Yamsuf of Enosh, and uh, and Miriam's there in some way. And then we have the well of Miriam later on, and the influence, the little leftover influence of of Enosh in Basia, and that comes to play later on. Wow. Now, Miriam's like watching. She's like, "What's going to happen to my well? <laughs> Don't mess it up! No." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay, but one more thing also. The Gemara says that Basia was married to Kalev, to Caleb. Yeah. As was Miriam. Oh, that's crazy. Miriam and Basia oh. were married to the same man, Kalev. Well, so, so I don't Caleb. even know that. You have, to, you have to do a deep dive into Kalev then. because the Kalev to... is, in, is in between, so to speak, the Miriam and the, and the Basia. And maybe that's some sort of effort to try to, you know, rectify whatever is wrong with Basia. And we know that Kalev, who kind of symbolizes a force that was not affected by the sins of the wilderness, right? Because he's the one who's able to go in. He's the only one besides for Joshua who's able to, well, it's important to note, he's the only one who was present by the golden calf that wasn't influenced by it. Because there's only two people that went into the wilderness, two of the original and you know, Exodus participants, and that's Joshua and Caleb. Joshua was not present. He was by the mountain. So he wasn't at all present by the sin of the golden calf. So there's only one person who was by the sin of the golden calf and enters the land, and that's Caleb. Right, and and, and his son was Hur, who, who who openly opposed, right? That's amazing. Yes. So they, he's the opposition to the He's ego. the only person who's not affected at all by the sin of the golden calf, despite being there. Wow. So he's, he's, he's like a purified removal of Enosh. Like he, he's the one person who's no influence of Enosh. So he marries and he's the lone calf. And he's the lone calf. And he's, he's trying to kind of marry both of the two to try to help, you know, influence or convey some of the perfection, so to speak, um to Basia to Fitz and therefore to not affect the uh the wall of Miriam. That's great. That is so great. 
I got lucky. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so I, I, you know, my apologies to the audience. I know this was kind of a took you for a spin. It took me for a spin too, but I, I think some of it's true. <laughs> I don't know if all of it's true, but I think well, some I, of it. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's definitely beautiful. And it's uh, like you said, it's uh, it's mind bending. It's a, it's a little bit longer than what we typically do, but I think it was laid out very beautifully. And we see a constant th- theme being strung between all these different uh, disparate uh, disparate events that all intersect. We have the generation of Enosh. They do idolatry. And all of human history is an effort to try to figure out how to either eliminate it, remove it, fight it, but completely eradicate it. It's, it's still hard. And the third temple which will be built in the month of Cheshvan, we are told, that symbolizes the final elimination of the influence of Enosh. It, we tried a bunch of times. We have seven degradations and we have the Mabel. And for some reason, the Mabel in the month of Cheshvan, it doesn't work. And then we have Moshe. He's being placed in a little teva. And that's an effort to try to rectify the sin of the of, of Enosh, but somehow the sin of Enosh is still present. And and Basi doesn't do her job and, that, and, and somehow there's a little bit of us left over in Moshe. And then there's Az Yash trying to fix it, but no, Micha corrupted it. And so on. There's all these ever. And then Solomon tries to do his, his job to get rid of Enosh. And then comes along Yeravim and he and he thwarts that effort. Uh, and all this is captured in the month of Cheshvan. And uh, please God, the month of Cheshvan will finally symbolize the one time that we're able to eradicate any elements, any remnants, any vestiges, any tiny little influence of this terrible virus that has plagued humanity since the times of Enosh. With the third temple, we will finally succeed where so many efforts failed. I just thought, as you're talking, I just thought that the word Enosh is going to be 357, and Mashiach is 358. It's like Mashiach champions oh. Enosh. <laughs> you're the only one in the world who would do that. <laughs> the word Enosh is 350. Do this math here. Shin, Nun, Vav. Enosh is 357. Wait. Why is it 357? Aleph Nunvavshin. Aleph Nunvavshin, yes. 357. And Mashiach is 58. <laughs> Mashiach symbolizes the one time we're finally able to get past. Yeah. Uh, that is absolutely beautiful. Now, this was magnificent. Yeah. This was ter- this was an incredible... It was worth the wait. Right? It's been a couple of months. <laughs> it was worth the wait. Uh, thank you so much, Roy Botnik, uh, for coming back and sharing this absolute incredible, incredible piece exquisite with us. Um, I'm looking forward. Please drop to many, many more. Um, your email is smbotnik at gmail.com. It has it changed? No, it's it's no, it's botnik sm. So oh. it's it's botnik, my last name, plus like spaghetti. And botnik is spelled with the C and a K. C and that's right. The bot, as in like a robot, bot, and then Nick, oh, like Nick, like like uh, Nicholas, Nick, right? Bot, Nick. Like imagine a little Nick or like a little robot. Right. Botnik, SM. Uh, at gmail.com. My email just says rabbi wallbegin.com. I hope the audio is tolerable on this podcast um, because it would be a, a shame uh, to not have this uh, presented to the world. I'm in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. You're in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, this was an incredible installment and please God, we'll have, we'll have many more opportunities. Thank you so much, Robert Botnick. This was amazing. All right. Thank you so much.